go for Zoom. Gone. Um, you had mentioned, too, pursuing that field because of the uh, lack of representation. Yeah. There's so many programs now that are really starting to address that. We had some STEM Seas uh, students come out with yes. us earlier this year, yeah, funded by the Natural Science that. Foundation. That was, that was pretty so cool. cool to see. And uh, Hannah, have you been to AGU? I'm going this. You're muted, I you but I could hear you from here. I'm going this December. <laughs> To present my work. She's not right. excited about it at all. I would. Uh, that's <laughs> in the water column. What? Yeah. Crinoid? Like crinoid? Swimming crinoid? I think it's stalked. It's a, or is it sea oh, is it stalked? It's a sea star, I think. No? <laughs> no, it looks like one. That's what threw me off. Is it? It is floating. I, oh, oh no, I see stalked. the stalk. Wow. Yeah, I see the stalk. Can you circle the stalk? I don't see it. Well, I can uh, see it in the still still I can uh, zoom and like see it. Oh, I see, I see. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Got it. Yep. That's a cool view. Um, and I, I'll bet that when you go to AGU, somebody's going to have a booth set up somewhere for women in geology. Mm -hmm. uh, I would. And if that. not, you'll probably be there next year setting one up. Yeah. <laughs> She's just going to grab a table and be like, "This is it." <laughs> it's unofficial. Table is sharpie. <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> Join our mailing list. Yeah. No, that would be awesome. Because I think, too, when I went for earlier this year in February, I went to you at the USGS at in Hilo, and there were, we had a presentation by one of the science, geoscientists there, and she, I forgot I forgot her name, but she was super nice. I'm going to look up her name Go for right Zoom after here. I'm talking. Go ahead. Aww. Here? Oh. <laughs> it's running away. Is that a black coral? Looks like it, but really oh. hard to tell. It's a waffle coral. Yeah, that is a black coral. Thank you. Steropathies. Nice. Coming out. But I know I've said this before, but this still camera, the <laughs> image quality is really good. Yeah, it's a nice camera. I've kept it around for about three years. What's that? We've kept it around for three years. It was brought out on a cruise by a scientist. And we, oh, wow. Huh. He, uh, he offered to leave it on board, and we oh, cool. took him up on it because yeah. it, the images were so good. Awesome. We, we had um, still cameras on a, a couple of expeditions. Um, we got them for the Monterey Rex in the Gulf, um, and I think they had, I think it was a system that e the EcoGig group brought out uh, for imaging corals that they, that they had us let us keep on. So we were just talking about uh, representation and I'm kind of reflecting back to like when I first took that geology class, something that I think made me appreciate the class even more, just like come into it with a lot of curiosity was um, one of the classes that I had to take as part of my like secondary education concentration was about the history and nature of just science. And the class required us to just read this book called The Scientists and I was like very frustrated for a while because the book pretty much goes through like all of science but very western focused and like um, I was just frustrated with like the lack of representation of like any other cultures or any other types of people but it taught me a lot about just kind of like how science traditionally was done and it was just Fish. like Really Sorry, cool. fish? Yeah, right. Two fish. Two oh. fish. Red fish, blue fish. Mm -hmm. They look long. Uh, according to Theodore Geisel. And you were saying, Tori? Oh, I'm sorry. I definitely lost my train of thought yeah, looking at the my fish. Bad. Um, it was, I think you were talking about uh, the science book and how oh, it's yes. there. Um, it taught me a lot just about how science traditionally was done and also like all the ways that uh, like who was doing science and why it was the way it was and then it was also interesting to learn about the progression of just like science in general in different disciplines so then when like geology came into the book I was just like blown away by like how much progress had been made and like such a little time. time. Yeah, yeah, or just like realizing like some of the stuff that I've grown up my whole life knowing is like 
an really absolute true I was, truth. I was just like, oh, this is like super recent and this is like really exciting stuff because like I just some of the questions people were asking I was like I did not know how long ago this was happening so like that gave me an even like deeper appreciation of like geology um and one of the things that I was really frustrated about was like I definitely felt like we were missing part of the story by only reading that book and one of our assignments was to choose a non-western scientist or culture and like write a 14 page essay about it and I was frustrated because I was like we're about to be teachers this essay is not a lesson plan this isn't a unit plan like this is in no way shape or form like gonna help me expose my students to other cultures and what science looks like and even talking to like Dr. Val out here she recommended me a book that was in the lounge um and it's called Soundings the story of the remarkable woman who mapped the ocean floor and I was like I spent a whole semester learning about like this story behind the science and I was like I'd never heard about her so like yeah. it literally like just like so much exposure I'm just so grateful for um you know having a space where I'm surrounded by people that can like keep showing me more about just science and how the definition has changed and who's been included and yeah it and is who gets to tell the story yeah. you know when you really think about it who has written the story who's written the histories um, you know, it's a colonial framework yeah. that we've been um, living under for so long. And even in Hawaii, our, our history, our true history, was subsumed under the colonial um, framework of annexation. There was never an annexation of mm -hmm. the kingdom of Hawaii. And so that story was told until people, um, Hawaiians, started questioning that history and going and digging in the archives and found evidence against that story mm. that had been told. So, you know, I think it's really important as women, as people of color, yeah. that we question this colonial framework that has told our story from not our perspective. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important that we, we question and that we reframe the ways that knowledge is transmitted and um, the power dynamics yeah. inherent in this, this, you know, in our science and within our education system. Mm. So I'm glad we're having this conversation. It's, these are important conversations. Yeah. And hopefully inspiring, you know, our viewers who maybe don't fit into certain um, areas of education that seem to don't have representation or people who look like them or stories of um, scientists mm -hmm. um, that haven't been told, especially of women, of women of color, oh, you know, it's of uh, men of color. And so that's a, that's a really important point to yeah. bring up, especially and as we do science. Yeah, and I'll say too, like when I found out about NALA, so it was about a month before the fellowship application was due, I immediately found like the social medias and uh, when I found the Instagram, mm -hmm. I saw like multiple posts about like indigenous sovereignty or data sovereignty and like seeing native people on the Instagram I was like wait a second I am so excited like this is something that like, I have to be part of mm -hmm. um, and that's just been an amazing experience just as a native person to step into a science space where it's like um <gasps> whoa what is that oh oh my god big guy oh is it does it look? Sh it looks really it looks shiny. Looks like an eel. It definitely does look like an eel. Massive. Puhi. Puhi. Let's see. Hawaiian word of the day. Puhi. 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 Eel. Puhi. I need to write that one down. Puhi. P U H I. We are scooting to keep up with this fish. Eel. Organism. Well, eels are fish. Okay, thank you. That's a big eel. Wow. Let's see. Definitely is some type of cutthroat eel. Cutthroat eel. Sounds dangerous. You know what we have not practiced today? Off into the blue. Wow. Our word, yeah, Our word. that we learned. Hold on. Wait, give me a minute. I'm I have it in. in my notebook. Okay. Okay, okay. By, uh, I have it, I have it. Oh, was that Derek that just nailed it? 
Huh? Is that uh, debris there, or is that rock? Oh, it's rock. Never mind. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. We don't have to say it together. Oh, okay. I think that would make it a little more complicated. Okay. <laughs> and go. <laughs> So yes, my reaction to that eel was, you know, I was excited, happy, stunned, interesting. I forgot all the words we said. Uh, we can use this for, but kupai anaha. Good job. Kupai anaha. Kupai anaha. Yeah. Kupai anaha, amazing. <laughs> Good job. Pololei. So, puhi, puhi for eel? Yes, puhi. Puhi. What is this stalked guy right here? It looks Go like resume. one of those like glass torches. Like. Oh yeah, like they're ah. blowing glass. Yeah, yeah. Where are you? What is that? Wow, it looks like it has like it little like, embryos or yeah, something like that. Yeah, it looks like it might be some kind of egg case of some sort. Daniel, have you seen anything like this? Uh, yeah, I was going to say it's like an egg case. But Should we stop? That's better. Yeah. Do, you like, want to, do you want to stop, Sebastian? Or um, good, good I got on. a couple pictures already. Yeah, I think so we're good to move on. I think we're good to move on. It's moving. That's from our down thrust. Oh, oh. Yeah. Is the whole thing the egg case or just those little dots? That I are think lined the up? whole bulbous area is an egg. I think the stalk is just a stalk to hold it on. Mm -hmm. But it might be some kind of fish egg casing or shark egg casing. So shark egg casings look a little more purse like. Yeah, there's, they're usually a little thicker too on the edges. It looks like a Rubik's Cube. Mm -hmm. I see that. Opai. Opai. Shrimp. Opai. 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 It has yellow eyes. This is a really beautiful, just bright red orange color. Opai. I think that's the oh, most vibrant a little color. Purple I've object seen. in the oh. seafloor there as well. Purple object. That's what it is. Downright. Oh, that. Downright? Yes. Might want to zoom on that. Under, under lasers right now. now. In front of this big rock. I think it's a there cucumber. Sea cucumber. A baby? A baby? <laughs> a baby? <laughs> huh? It looks compact. Yeah. Going in. That was further away than I thought. Yes. Uh, purple tea gumber. It just looks like it's sleeping on the rock. It does look very peaceful. Mm -hmm. Coming out. A lot of things, new things in a short amount of time. Then we got this little nebney right here. Bridge nap. Could please modify our bearing to three three four. Thank you. Sebastian, I have a question for you. So as we've been exploring um, the deep ocean, I've noticed a lot of the organisms. Uh, beyond the corals seem to have like a very translucent oh, no. nature. Yes. Is there a, there, what is, what's going on there? Oh, no. um, uh, it can depend on the species. Um, in the deep sea, being translucent is about as equally helpful as being black. Um, uh, so it can help in the water column, help them blend in, especially if they're organisms that use bioluminescence to hunt. Um, 
but it's also po equal possibility that they just simply evolved to not have solid pigments in the deep sea just because they're just selecting out their colors naturally. Mm -hmm. um, so it's equally possible, but if I were to lean for that particular cucumber, I imagine it's partially pelagic when it needs to be, so being partially translucent and harder to see with bioluminescent light is, is, is a possibility. Mm. Mahalo. Of course. It's kind of interesting how certain adaptations of deep sea happen because there are certain animals like the um, barbel dragonfish that actually are able to channel their light into a flashlight. And even then, they can also use red bioluminescence so that other animals cannot see them looking for them. Mm. That's kupaya naha. That's just amazing. <laughs> I'm surprised that uh, corals have not developed a defensive mechanism against sea stars. Oh, um, that, that's you know, a question. So barbed that's... bases or something, toxins, etc. And I guess that this just has is it a trait that hasn't quite evolved yet. Right. Because sea stars are pretty vapid predators on yeah. many Nidarian species. So maybe it's just a very hard adaptation to form in the first place. So we're um, we're thinking that uh, a couple of isobaths below waypoint five, we might want to slow and get a rock. Yes, right there, Derek. Right where your cursor is. Yeah. Danny again. with that cursor. <laughs> Keeps it in a holster when he's not. <laughs> Sebastian, now I'm wondering, how do sea stars find the corals to eat them? Like, do they just like move and like realize that they're on top of a coral and um, start eating? For deep sea corals, I am unsure. I'm sure there is possibly a chemical smell component there, given in the dark. And a lot of their tube feet are often very sensitive. Um, so they may be able to pick up chemical trails in the water that kind of lead them to prey, but I am not sure exactly on that. Once they find a coral to start eating, do they just kind of hang out there with that coral until they're like... Until they've gotten their fill, yes. Yeah. Whoa. Oh, wow. Yeah, Very. well, can, can we try to get just a, a measurement of this thing like with laser sonic? Kind of, uh, this is a massive... Whoa. That's just enormous. Wow. Kupaya Naha. Kupaya Naha. Wow. Yes. Yeah, if we can somehow... They've got some lasers on there. Okay. Can we also get a zoom on the zo on the polyps, please? Sure. Can we come in a little closer? That came out of nowhere. We've seen, no we've yeah. seen, no we've seen nothing this size. I saw it in the uh, Atalanta screen. Uh, Zoomed yeah. up to it. So the view of, it, of Atalanta kind of shows you some of the scale relative to yeah. Mercury. Mm -hmm. All right. Looks like a blanket. Go for zoom in? Yeah. I'm Looks just going to go all comfy. the way in and get a quick focus, yep. and maybe we'll get what we need from this. It has a black skeleton, so I'm leaning a black closer. coral. Coming out. Another massive black But that could be the shading. Okay. Come on. Maybe try to get some focus on the ones in the back, because they're a little bit well lit. Um, yeah, I'm still leaning black coral. The polyps don't look black coral to me. They look like a bamboo. Or they could be bamboo. Do do we have a clear sight on the base? I can come around. Good. Coming out. You guys want me to stop moving? Yeah, let's stop this. Uh, Bridge nav. I might be on crystal getting a small clipping of this. All stop, please. Looks like it's two, two corals. Yes. If uh, we are considering a clipping, I highly recommend the smaller one on the left. So 
So do we want Why a sample? That? I might have to step um, up. Surely because the bigger one might topple to the angle. Okay, do we want to stop then and come back? Like and move the ship back to so we can be stable? Um, sure, if we okay. want to take a sample. That's uh, perfect with the lasers. Bridge nap. Can we get a zoom on the base? Yes, Going please. on the base. We'll do a Holding there. At one okay, I'm leaning less. Could be black coral, but I don't see any bamboo striping. I, I yeah, it doesn't seem like a bamboo coral. Thing. Yeah. Um, uh, Asako, Tina, if you're in the chat, we could use a little help here. Yeah, if we can just say like, one zoom in, you'll, you'll see it on the polyps. Ready when you are. Oh, let me come out. Are we stable? Yeah, let me uh, try to get stable here for a second. I also see some small, possibly red associates right there in the middle. They're kind of hard to see. You can go for zoom. All right, full zoom. Yeah, ophiorides. Coming out. Coming out fast. Um, Asako thinks we may have collected this in earlier in the expedition, a Parsonella. So I don't think we need to take a sample. Okay, that sounds good. Hopefully. Thank you, Asako. Thank you. Pick up and catch up. That was so beautiful. It reminds me of the cherry blossoms. I don't know if any of you have ever seen yeah, the cherry sure. blossoms in um, Waimea on Hawaii Island. They have a festival and it's just spectacular. Coming up I think DC also has cherry blossoms. I've been in DC. Yeah, Japan. Yeah, DC and Japan, I've seen them in, yep. University of Washington has a beautiful a quad. quad with yeah. cherry mm -hmm. blossoms in the spring. It's gorgeous. Wow. Yeah, I love that color so much. And I also just want to highlight the collaboration that we just witnessed in looking at that coral and throwing out ideas. And we've got amazing scientists on shore that are giving feedback. Um, it's just really awesome to witness, and I'm so glad that our viewers are able to see um, kind of behind the scenes of when we see something out here, it's not just one person, you know, one person's ideas that come through, or really a team. That co collaboration is just amazing to witness. I agree. Very, very um, great teamwork. Yeah, and we're, and we're lucky to have uh, people like Asaka who are, who are paying attention, like, it seems like all the time. Yeah. At least on our morning watches <laughs> she, when she's, she's awake. She's um, omni because, omnipresent. Because <laughs> she's able to tell us, yes. you know, if we don't need to redundantly sample something. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, we want to be very targeted about the, the things that we're taking clippings of. Especially something as beautiful as that yeah. Paris Tanella. I'm pretty sure if Virginia saw that, she would have gone crazy for it. Because I think <laughs> she was going crazy for the smaller ones. We got that one was huge. Highlights. So, um I wanted to share another cool, I shared about the Kumulipo, which is one of our Hawaiian cosmologies that kind of um, shares the creation of life from a Hawaiian perspective. Um, in the, the Kumulipo, the first organism that is born from the Lipo Lipo, that deep darkness, is a coral polyp. So, you know, that's earlier I had mentioned that we consider that our eldest ancestor Another really important facet of the Kumulipo is this um, relationships. So that everything that's born in the ocean has a counterpart on land. And so these pairings, this, this dualism, 
is really cool because they care for each other. And so um, they also have similar either characteristics or spawning patterns, or um, there's some kind of traits um, that match the pairs, that our ancestors would match the two pairs up based on that deep observational process of kilo. And so you, when you look at the Kumulipo, it's over 2,100 lines of, of um, natural history of the Hawaiian universe. And it's, it's just amazing. It's, it's an amazing epic. It's an amazing um, history of the Hawaiian archipelago and the people and our co-development together. Um, because Hawaiians are part of the ecosystem. You know, we've never been outside of it. And it's such a beautiful way to look at the universe that knowing that you're a component of it, um, an integral component as are all the other life forms that were born. And another cool part of the Kumulipo is that humans aren't born until halfway through the cosmology, which really tells us something that all of these organisms that are born before us are our elders, they're our siblings. And it really kind of speaks to our place as a younger sibling and how we need to take care of our older siblings. So it's just a really um, beautiful way to be um, understanding your place in the world. Wow, that's beautiful. That's yeah. a really interesting yeah. thing, Malia. One of the most uh, impactful things of, of my uh, education was in my kind of one of the very first uh, oceanography classes, and they had the history of Earth broken up in the equivalent of 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And uh, humans have only been around for about 300,000 years, so if you uh, put that uh, equivalent of the history of Earth, which is you know, close yeah. to four billion years, it's, it would be one second on a 24-hour day. Mm -hmm. and so just uh, putting into perspective, Good what, perspective w yeah. what we as humans have done in that one second, it's, it's really remarkable. I've also heard it told in the, in the space of a year where uh, it'd be like the last few minutes of, of December 31st or you know something like that. Just wow. this little speck yeah. in the time continuum of time and space. This has me thinking a lot about um, kind of like the first uh, unit that my earth science students do where we introduce them to just kind of like, what is science? Welcome to high school. This is your first it's science first class. Um, how do we do science? How do we make observations? And Malia, what you just shared about the Kumulipo and all of those deep observations that took place, I'm really excited now to think about uh, how to share that with my students and how we can practice making observations and, you know, becoming better scientists. So I'm very excited to think more about this. Yeah, yeah. and there's lots of great resources. I would recommend um, as a first primary document would be the um, Kumulipo um, translated by Queen Lili'u Okalani. Um, for me, she's my go-to on this as a native um, Hawaiian, as a native Hawaiian speaker. Um, another translation was done by Martha Beckwith, um, who was an uh, uh, anthropologist in the 1940s and 50s. And there are um, curriculum online mm -hmm. that you can access that speak to um, the Kumulipo and some of the ways that you can incorporate that into your um, lessons. So check out um, ulukau, U-L-U-K-A-U dot org. And it's a, um, it's a beautiful website filled with all kinds of uh, reference books, wow. um, educational resources, incredibly um, rich repository of Hawaiian culture, language, wow. and resources. Thank you. That gave me a really good starting point. <laughs> So we're, just an update for our viewers, we are at a depth of 1,970 meters. Um, we started at over 2,500 meters. 
We're heading towards waypoint five. How many waypoints do we have anyway? Six we or seven? Ten. Oh, ten. Ten. Uh, ten. ten. Jeez. <laughs> so that one put us about yeah, yeah. halfway through the transit. All right. So. Cool. Well, um, we're along a ridge. So the last couple of dives have been on guillots or like uh, flat top seamounts. Um, this is more of a volcanic ridge, so it's a very different sort of thing that we're looking at. Um, and we're this the these waypoints are plotting a track that kind of go along the top of the ridge as we slowly get shallower. So um, I think we're going to only a depth of uh, 14 like yeah, like 14, 1500. So it's not going to get as shallow as previous dives. Um, it's interesting though. We're we're seeing similar corals, but not the sort of abundance that we saw on the other seamounts uh, until we run smack into that massive <laughs> coral. Um, so we're probably going to be looking for another rock sample in a little bit as we approach waypoint five. This one right here? Huh? <laughs> this one right here? No, not that one. Well, that the strap one is the back of the back. You'll have to drop all your weights to pick up that one. <laughs> Uh, I do like the idea, though, of her coming up just like hugging a massive rock. <laughs> um, just not here. No, we're not really all that far from our last dive, either, are we? Uh, we trained well, 50 to, to yeah. 80 miles. We're what? 50 to 80 miles, somewhere in that range. Mm, I'm not sure exactly, but... It, it's I mean, in the sit wrap, but I just don't remember. Oh, yeah, we're about a uh, hundred nautical miles from that last Yeah, we, we, yeah. Out, we transited quite a ways before. Um, we're, so we were, uh, the last dive was was the farthest seamount at the very edge of Papahanao, Makuakea. Um, and we're now working our way uh, back towards Hawaii. Um, and we'll be, we'll be sort of mapping and stopping on seamounts along the way. Um, so... Yeah, there, there could be some, some decent transits between them. I think there's other ones near that are closer by that we'll be getting on, but we'll be doing some transit and mapping between each dive for the most part. Thinking of last dive, um, I was starting to th think about how Malia was talking about the Kumalipo. Um, and I'm just thinking, like, maybe a good name for that seamount might be Kabuna Seamount, given the huge amount of old, large corals that we saw on it. Yes, kupuna is such a beautiful word that incorporates that, that look at our ancestors. And so the, the naming process is actually a really cool process. Um, part of um, our management strategy at Papahamna Mokoakea is our ad, um, advisory board called the Native Hawaiian Cultural Working Group. And this group is made up of yep. educators and scholars and Hawaiian language speakers and cultural practitioners and scientists. And um, they have a nomenclature subcommittee that uh, takes on this big kuleana or responsibility and privilege of naming species and sea mounts. And um, it is quite the process. And so they meet regularly. They discuss the characteristics, the depths, the associated um, mo'olelo or his historical narratives um, that are associated with this place. And, and it's a really amazing process to see them come up with names that have such meaning and such mana, such power in the names. So it's, um, I'm, I'm so looking forward to um, seeing how that process evolves as they gather the information that we've been working on and researching and the organisms that live on these seamounts and um, see what name they come up with. I'm sure it'll be beautiful and meaningful and highly appropriate for that space. Tori, I see you're looking at some of the curriculum on the um, yes. ulukau.org. I found awesome earth science resources. Um, and I found this uh, curriculum book, and I'm looking at, I think this is like one of the first lessons, and it's called 
here comes the sun and this is literally like what my students are learning right now I'm so excited awesome. <laughs> yes I like just opened it but now I'm like oh I'm ready to like restart teaching earth science again with the new semester Aww. and it's rooted in cultural practice yes and this is I'm gonna be honest with you like this is making me so excited because like this was the stuff that I was like begging to see in college when it comes to planning curriculum and uh, just like how to uh, yeah, just like so many times where we're like, you know, encouraged to um, include cultural knowledge into our teachings, especially in science. Like I was given like nothing in terms of like how to start. Mm -hmm. And it felt like a lot of times I was sometimes the one like starting those conversations of like, this isn't enough. Like I want to, you know, I'm in school to learn how to do this. And I really wanted to like be given some like resources to start with. So Malia, I'm like so excited and so grateful that you literally just gave me like, a few places to go and like just not even like two minutes on here I just found this entire book with so many teachings so yeah. and you know the the thing is that um, so many people put their time and effort into this and we don't have to reduplicate the wheel yeah. you know there's yeah. there's curriculum out there that we can adapt to our students and our places and really make it relevant you know for the kids it's not like theoretical but like mm -hmm. really hands-on kind of learning that they enjoy and can really relate to. Yeah, and I'll just read, because uh, I said this is like what my students are learning right now. Um, the questions that students are uh, trying to find the answers to in this lesson are, how does the angle of the sun affect our climate and weather? And how did Hawaiians mark the passage of the sun from the equinox to the solstice? So this is like so amazing to see. Um, so yes, I'm very excited. Nice, I'm glad. Hopefully this will be helpful for you and your, oh, your yes. students. Yes, it definitely will be. And we mahalo all the kumo, um, the teachers who yeah. created all of this curriculum. I think Daniel just left, but I was also gonna just thank him for starting oh. that conversation about the perspective of um, humans and the earth and making it like super simple to think about just even like a year, like what you were saying, Mike, or just think yeah. about like in a day. Um, that really, I feel like gives perspective for us to like start thinking about human impacts like in our earth science class that I'm teaching and our relationship and yeah. Just great conversations this morning that's having me excited about thinking about um, how I'm going to engage my students when I get back home. And that's really the key, you know, we yeah. can do research in a, in a vacuum and none of those, none of it gets out, it's not disseminated. So if we can take what we're learning from this place um, and whether it's for our management or the ways that we can use this information to help other communities, um, then I think then research is, is, you know, highly valuable. Some cup corals, sponges. We're seeing a small, what appears to be a part Parstinella, which is that branch coral we saw earlier, and another of those umbrella pathies that Daniel pointed out. I'm seeing a lot of those dying Walteria sponges on this on this shelf. So it must not be a really good flow of nutrients around here. But would have been at one point in time, huh? Yeah, it appears to be. What's going on there? What? That sponge is covered in sediment, I think. Yeah. Oh no, it's partially dying. Yeah, it looks like that. Huh. 
I'm noticing the ophiorides have been linking up to a lot of these sponges on where they are dying. And so I'm wondering if these brittle stars are linked to the death or if they're just being attracted to the dying mm -hmm. tissue. Well, I wonder if they're eating the dying tissue. Yeah, you guys let me know if that's out of focus. That's a great shot, thank you. I can't tell. Maybe if I zoom all the way in, I can. There you go. Coming out. Trying to come out, there it goes. So, Tori, I think if I was a uh, year nine or a uh, uh, freshman mm -hmm. science teacher, earth science teacher coming back from an expedition like this. Uh, not only would I be looking to incorporate stuff into my lesson plans, but I'd be ringing up Hannah to see when she could talk to my students. Yeah, I'll be honest. I have um, one idea that I've been thinking about where um, I read this one teacher story about how they started these like daily dedications at the beginning of class where mm. the teacher started with kind of dedicating the class period to people that inspired them or important to them and then the students took over um, and that's something that I like tried to start one semester and it did not uh, mm. go very well and I was kind of uh, a little bit discouraged by it but I'm realizing like I've got all these amazing people out here that like I think it would be awesome to start class kind of every day like when I get back with just like one person that I've met through this experience right. and just share a little bit about them, what I've learned from them and their path. And I think that that is going to be like, that's going to start so many conversations for my students. And then, cool. um, do yeah. you have a specific teacher that really had, was impactful for you when you were younger? Very three, one, five. Yeah. I think about my, was, Sixth grade, um, I was in El Paso, Texas. Um, my like humanities teacher, they combined like our English and kind of our social studies curriculum. And we had so much fun in that class. Um, he gave us like so many opportunities to be creative in a way that like I've tried to replicate <laughs> so often in my own classroom. And uh, we spent a lot of time, like we read the Iliad and like, that was wow. a story that like- I love the Iliad. Yeah, as a sixth grader, we'd yeah. be sitting there being like, who is this person? I forgot this name, but like, we were so into it because like throughout the process, we would like be writing our own plays, performing our own little plays, like in huh. front of the class, like we'd be split in teams and each of us were assigned like, um, like throughout reading this, we would like take breaks and study um, both like Greek and Roman mythology and each of us got assigned like a god or a goddess that we got to pick and like create this beautiful poster like just so many like fun lessons <laughs> and uh, I just really appreciate that so yeah Mr. Macia in El Paso, Texas and that school was Ross Middle School and have you ever had a chance him. to reconnect with them? I've tried to find him um, I left like September of my, my seventh grade year. Yeah. Um, I guess I could just like email the school, but I've like tried to go back and like find him like on social media. Right. It's a uh, sixth grade is a little young for the Iliad. That's impressive. Yeah. yeah. It's not easy to read. And I'll be honest, like the next year, right when I was leaving, we had started The Hobbit. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like not a very fun way that we were reading it. And it made me like hate it and I moved really? and I never finished it and it oh, actually wow. wasn't until like uh, COVID like I was in college and I had to read The Hobbit again for like a great books class and I was like oh this book and then I read <laughs> it and I was like this is amazing this book is, it's really fun <laughs> yeah and I was so like I wonder what the like how did you guys read it that made you hate um, it like, like one each page chapter, at a time <laughs> each chapter we had to do this like packet of analysis oh, yeah and it was just like a lot of writing that like for me at the time I was like I'm not used to sitting down and just writing Oh, Mr. Yeah. Messia had us, like, I still have, like, the newspaper that we wrote. Like, each class period, like, had a, um, I guess, like, a decade. I don't remember, but we, like, were a newspaper staff for, like, a few weeks. And, like, each huh. of us had a role. And that was, like, you know, we were practicing our writing in that way. And oh, I think, that? like... Dead sponge? Very large dead sponge? Mm -hmm. Extra large. Yeah, that's really big. Oh, and I didn't even really dead. It. 
Wow. It's oh. weird. It's interesting to see something like that and then living stuff right next to it. Or growing are on those, it. Yeah, I was about to ask, are those sponges growing on top of I'm it? I'm not sure if it's growing on top of it or, or just the, living parts of it still. Oh. Things directly in front of us might still be living parts of it, but off to the right and left, I'm not sure. Go for zoom? Yeah, coming in a bit. It's Oproid heaven here. Yeah, it looks like it's parts of it are alive, but there are other sponges that were growing on top of it that have also died, it looks like. Coming out. Yep. So because it's such a large sponge, could this actually just be its normal, like, mortal life instead of, like, some other kind of impacts? Um, I think it's just environmental conditions on this side of the seamount appears because it seems to me that most sponges are struggling here. Yeah. I don't see much of a flow or marine snow, so it's likely that there's not much nutrition in general around here. It seems that these parsonellids are very doing pretty well, surprisingly. So it could be something else. Not quite sure. Is that an anemone, the red? Yes, that is a closed anemone. I'm gonna be honest, I've been looking for that color because I really want to see a tronicops. So when I see something that shade... Um, it's a nice color. Yeah. It really stands out. This one looks like a candy cane. <laughs> that would also need that red color though. There's a Venus fly... No, that's yeah. just a bent over... Oh, uh, no, it's still a fly trap one, I Is think. It? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Good too. Yeah, coming in. Is it dying? No, I think it's just resting. It's sad. Mm -hmm. And there's another kite in there on the left, yeah. a white one. It just had a bad day. Coming out. Thank you. It's like, don't look at me. I have a, having a bad <laughs> hair day. Mike, you would like this a project that we did in his class. <laughs> okay, he, like, he just brought bit. out a bunch of different, yeah, like, I don't know, like, scrap material, essentially trash, and yeah, gave us, like, a minute to trash. sort through it and pick oh, yeah, that so like many items and then, like, create a new invention. And so oh, we had, like, yeah. weeks to make something, and that was the hardest thing I've ever done. And then when we <laughs> brought him back to class, we had to, like, set it up like a museum and go around the room and look at everyone's inventions and come up with, like, let's say that we were looking at this as an artifact from, like, hundreds of years ago. Oh, I love that. Yeah, but what so, like... Has, what Maybe what was this? And that was, like, yeah. so challenging. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's tough to be creative on the spot. And you, like, yeah. you can't force, you know, a good idea to pop into your head. Sometimes you just have to, like, let it happen. But then it's frustrating when you're on a timeline. That's cool, though. I mean, I, li I like the assignment, but I can also understand why it's stressful. Yes. I will say, like, it challenged me in ways that I had not been challenged before. And even, like, the reflection period, like, when we were looking at everyone's creations, I, like, was very stuck in being, like, I don't know, like, a religious reason. And, like, I remember him sitting me down and being, like, I want you to think more. <laughs> like, oh, let's yeah. think, like, just what else beyond, beyond like, because I was making up anything to be, like, I don't know, maybe a... Uh, religious I don't know and then like <laughs> each of us got to like go up and explain like what we created um, and that was really fun so we were talking earlier yeah. about teachers and teachers that inspired us do uh, does anybody else have like a teacher that just like totally stands out in their mind um, well, I'll, uh, yeah I have a parallel answer um, I've had so many people that helped me and uh, assisted in my learning and, you know, just progress as a human. Um, and I always have made an effort to let them know later how appreciative I am. But uh, I came back from a trip to uh, somewhere, a Spanish-speaking place somewhere. And it occurred to me that, you know, I had two years of Spanish in high school, and I wasn't even, I was a lousy Spanish student. But being able to retain what I have retained has really opened up a large part of the world and enabled me to connect with people in ways that I would not be able to connect otherwise. And 
I actually reached, found my high school Spanish teacher and sent her a note saying, I was just another crappy student. You don't remember me at all. Uh, but thank you. You know, I, I appreciate what I learned. And uh, Tori, hopefully this happens to you at the end of your career. She, she's retired now. She sent me a note saying, you know, I appreciate the, oh what yeah, this? that? Weird shadow from it too. I it was predating. Something's predating this coral right here. Yeah. Is that, uh, What's that word for oh. gorged? It's eating the umbella pathies, but I can't get a good look on what I it is. I cannot figure out what looks that Looks like is. it might actually be a cucumber. Like folded over? Yeah, because you're looking at the oh, little spikes yeah. on the back. That's unusual. But it looks like it's grown, or maybe it's got its stomach out on top of um, the organism. I don't know. Hold it's on, let me see what I mean right down in there. Or is it possibly an anemone on the other side? Oh, that's more likely? More likely. It looks like it's like grown around it. The top, though, yeah. And like that zoom in we just had on that hole, the yellow, is that a stomach, maybe? Uh, um, or is that no, well, if it's a, it's if it's an enemy, it should be, there should not be the a stomach base there. It's grabbing on. That's why I'm confused. I'm wondering if it's just engulfing it and accidentally killing the polyps, but yeah, not eating them. I think that's the case. I think you're right. Yeah, because I'm leaning towards an enemy trying to get to higher ground right here, but it's, um. Definitely putting a little bit too much weight on that coral. <laughs> cool. Cool. Thank you. So to wrap up, Tori, this oh. retired teacher told me. Oh, uh, Daniel says that it yeah. might be, it looks like a sea star and eviscerating his stomach. But nope, Can't he's correcting, <laughs> saying that I'm correct. <laughs> um, but this teacher told me that she, uh, as a retired Spanish teacher, gets an email like that every couple weeks. Uh, That's cool, though. Uh, it's nice that uh, people reached back out. Yeah, and uh, uh, and she's like, you're absolutely correct. I have no idea who you are. Uh, <laughs> uh, but she, the fact Thanks that that anyway. happens to her continually, <laughs> yeah. what, what a great payback for a, a rich career. Yeah, oh, I love okay. that. I'm like literally sitting here right now trying to find this teacher I'm talking about. You're correct. No, You're correct. I have no idea who you are. Yeah, yeah. I think literally those were, I, I might, I'm sure I kept that message. It was it's kind of like noteworthy. soul crushing. Even, no, though, even no, though you I, do that. It's I just appreciate like, oh. the awareness of yeah. just being like, just so many students, so many years. That was something yeah. that like, my first time working at a summer camp I work every summer, I like, knew all those kids so well, so well, so well. And I remember like the next year, so many of the other staff members were like, sharing a short story and being like what was that kid's name and i'd remember and be like how come y'all don't remember these kids and they were like tori just wait a few years like we we spend yeah. time with so many oh, students yeah. Yeah. like it's like you remember them and like their stories but like sometimes that happens but like honestly that first group i love them i actually meant to ask you uh, when you were t talking like earlier yeah what uh instrument did you play in the orchestra this is where um, we're supposed to be looking I for played rock the viola. And oh, and cool. i started in fifth okay. grade and rock and and when i was in el paso like our elementary schools had orchestra yeah and like that was something that like once i moved away from el paso like i yeah. did not go to another school with an orchestra i was gonna say that's yeah. yeah that's tough yeah. to find and i'd like get somewhere and they'd be like come play in the band and i'd be like with what yeah huh? i don't play and yeah my parents would like try really hard to find me. Is that a little big? Oh, it looks like it's attached actually. Uh, it could be just precarious, yeah. It, it, or this one. That's a little more reasonable. Yeah, either that one or that one. Uh. trying so hard to find it. I like see pictures of him everywhere and I'm like, where? Where is the sample going to go? But you don't remember his Starboard name? Box? I remember his um, name. We can put it in Starboard oh. box B, C, D, or F. I think B, D, C, or D would be ideal. Cool. 
Uh, could we get... Oh, you're working on it. Never mind. Then we'll need... Oh, oh we got it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm gonna do a little push right here. Let me get some focus. Oh, dust storm. Let's rotate. Bum, 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 ba -dum. There you go. That looks great. <laughs> cool. Oh, it looks, it looks porous. Yeah, it looks like there's vesicles so. in there. Yeah, Maybe it looks like there's some dead sponge on it. One another. Here, yeah. give you a better Is shot. that still good? Yeah, it's still good. Okay. Okay. And simple. You can maybe make it around? Yeah. <clears throat> Maybe. It seems like all of my family members, I was, I'm reaching out to them, like, letting you know I'm on. They're like, yeah, we're watching the LSU game. I'm like, dang. That's really funny. They're like, we can talk to you anytime. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there you go, sample. Let me see if they're even winning. Okay, they are winning. They're winning 17 to 0. <laughs> Reminder, preference for B, C, or D. E, C, O, D. Uh, let's go Maybe it'll fit? I don't know. I think it's a little tight. Hannah touched her mic as you, like, it seemed like oh, you it looked clock, like. clocked it on the uh, the sample box. I thought it made a noise. If it's too big, we can throw it in F. F, okay. Thank you. Sample 062. Thank you, front row. You're welcome. Going back to dive.
So this um, topography that we're looking at kind of reminds me of um, Hawaii Island used to have this beautiful pond near Kalapana called Queen's Bath. And it was made of all of this lovely like pahoehoe lava filled with cold spring water. Wow. And it was like the favorite place for people to um, go and swim because it was like the only like freshwater pond in that area. And it was just gorgeous. It was really long, maybe like about, whew, it was pretty long, like maybe the size of a half of a football field and kind of elongated, but it was just such a beautiful place. But I think like the 1980s um, with the eruption, it was filled in by uh, Tutu Pele who, who filled in this, this water hole um, as she made her way to the ocean. But a lot of people who grew up on Hawaii Island have fond memories of this beautiful um, area called Queen's Bath near Kalapana. Oh, yeah. Any else? Okay, vesicles, okay, good. Moving so on. Mm -hmm. Moving on. Yep. Sorry, I didn't say that earlier. Moving on. This is from uh, really camp. cool underwater features on the Big Island, north of Kona, up at Puaka. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Just beautiful little, almost like valleys and uh, just gorgeous up there. There's a lot of like ankyaline ponds um, along the coastline there, and several um, fish ponds as well but you've got the spring water and then you've got the mixture with the kai, the ocean water, and it creates these really like beautiful environments. I just wanted to thank this rock sample, this, and Malia, mm -hmm. uh, you can correct me if I'm mispronouncing, but Pohaku? Pohaku? Pohaku. 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 Um, and we're just so grateful for all of the information that we're going to learn. Yes. Once we get back up to the surface. Hannah, have y'all been using the rock saw already? We have. So that was a little under the weather. So we didn't get a chance to do it yesterday, but we are going to do it today with the samples that we got yesterday. Okay. Not yesterday. Yeah. On the first unnamed email. Oh, was wait, it yesterday? No. Oh, yeah, it was yeah. yesterday. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Days Time here are kind of just seems to strange. fly and melt yeah. on board. <laughs> well, also because, like, we, I'm guessing, we each probably sleep at least twice a day because it's, like, yes. pun punctuated sleeping rather than, like, one long sleep. Yeah. So it's kind of like, what day was that? Because it's not just one sleep ago. Mm-hmm. Feels yeah, like, yeah. I, I don't know when it was, but on a recent watch, I left here expecting that it was daytime and breakfast. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, times. yeah. yeah. <laughs> and no, no, it's nighttime. Yeah, it's funny. Funny. Which part of the day is it again? I've realized it's easier for me to think about time in dives yeah. rather than days, because like the days, it just doesn't make sense. Or just by meals. Yes. Well, I feel like we started the cruise <laughs> and we'd get off of watch at night. And it would be yeah. and it would be dark. Yeah. And now it's we get off at night and it's yeah. Light. It's because we um, it's dark. So we're it's further dark. west and we're gonna be moving our way southeast. Uh, so that's gonna actually start changing again, just to confuse us. Yep. I did the transit earlier this year from Honolulu to British Columbia, and uh, every other day we moved our clocks forward an hour. So. When we finally arrived in Canada, it felt like we all had boat lag. That's going to start messing you up, yeah. your internal clock. That's really steep on the uh, left, huh?
Yes, yeah, so I wonder if there was some geological event that would have changed the flow of current that's affecting these sponges. Possibly. Um, looking at this, this is almost like the sponge to coral ratio almost makes this a sponge reef, but it appears to be mostly dead. And I'm not sure if that's related to the volcanism or the current or... I don't think volcanism has been active here in quite quite some time. Yeah, so... So I wouldn't say there's been a geological event. It's very interesting that they're all just mass dying off around here. Right. Is there any such thing as a uh, sponge disease that we know about? Um, nothing that I know of off the top of my head. Especially in a deep sea environment. That's a round rock. I was going to say, look at that boulder. Otherwise, this would, be a fant drop off there. this would be a fantastic yeah. glass reef if it weren't, they weren't all like dying, dead wow. or partially dying. This would be Chris Kelly heaven. So I was at a deep sea corals conference earlier this year and uh, it was remarkable to me like how little we actually know some basic life history of a lot of these deep sea species like in terms of their reproduction how they how the yeah like basically their whole reproductive cycle where the, how far they disperse and um, how long they can live how fast they grow uh, as you can imagine it's very hard to study and answer those questions There's so, a, lot of, uh, a lot of work going on around the world to uh, actually try to cultivate some of these deep sea species in a lab setting. Oh, and wow. Just, like, examine some of their basic life history and understand their sort of life cycle. It's pretty interesting. I'm sorry to think if it's worth sampling one of the partially dying ones. I was thinking the same thing. But I don't know how you determine. Like, what do you even look for? We look for the ones that are half white. Right, and then what do you do once you have it in a lab? Um, I don't know. If you preserve it, there might be bacteriophages or something yeah. or some nutritional analyses that can be done. Yeah, I think the right. challenge is finding, like, the right researcher that would... Yeah. Oh, that Chris that Kelly that. might be well, uh. well connected for that. I'm wondering if it's worth sample. Maybe wait till Daniel walks back in and gets his opinion. I'm full for white. Go for zoom. Go on in. Approaching waypoint five on our dive plan, just for reference. We're uh, 10 hours into the dive. 11, sorry. Yeah. It's about halfway. Going all the way in. Waypoint five is about half the transect length. Oh. Slow pull out. Is that the Paracentella? Yeah, the Paracinella. Well, Peristinella, I think you had it right. And then there's a bubble cum coral right directly below this, which is the first that I've seen on this side. Now, see, that one actually looks like a bubble gum coral to me because they're all closed, so it looks more like the bubble gum. I think that's the slowest I've gotten this lens to zoom. Yeah. So Derek, you bring up a really good point about our um, lack of knowledge of deep sea corals. I know like for our shallow corals, there's several um, impacts, like the um, increase Where? in temperature. Oh yeah, sorry, go ahead. Like sedimentation. Um, Sebastian, what are, do you know what some of the other impacts potentially could be for the oh, deep like, sea? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm distracted right now. Oh, sorry, go ahead. We got <laughs> the cow thing and the ROV. We're being invaded. Joyride. What? <laughs> Hold on, I gotta clip this. People ask me all the time during interactions about... That's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> where did he come from? Wait, you yeah, say hitch a ride. They're probably like, where are we going? Wait, what's happening? 
I've been climbing this mountain for months. I, I think he's hitchhiking. You can see yep. just his arm in the still camera. It's really funny. <laughs> How did y'all notice this? Uh, brow camera. Down, that down looking camera shot <laughs> for months. So cute. When did they get there? Have they been here this entire I the, time? I saw the thumbs up and I... I said, uh, <laughs> no, I saw it swimming in, in the still camera. I think it landed then, like, just a, just like a minute ago. Um, like, what's the procedure in this? Ah. Oh, that, I think he's... That's the procedure. It's <laughs> oh. <laughs> when they swim like that, they look like a face hugger from Alien. Oh, he's oh. still there. Okay, he's gone now. I oh no, he's still there. <laughs> he still wants to hop on. <laughs> this is all getting documented in the dialogue. That was really funny. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Malia, that would have upstaged anybody um, talking. Oh, maybe totally. we should collect <laughs> this partially dying right. sponge, but I'm not sure yet. But maybe if we see more down the line, Daniel Wagner is in the room. Gonna do a little push and boop. But yeah, but to go back to that point about the corals too, about you know what are some of the impacts to them, um, we know a lot more about the ones that are in the shallow than we do about the ones in the deep. So understanding what's impacting them can only help um, with the management of Papahanao Mokoakea. Yeah, I think one thing I gleaned from some of the experts in this topic at that conference was that uh, it seems to be highly species specific was what I was hearing it was, um, it was like some some species can handle like different sedimentation rates better mm -hmm. than others or temperature changes things like that so it's very it's not like big generalities I think that are easy to make I don't know um, Sebastian what your um, take on that topic is um, just deep sea coral communities in general are kind of hard to study because there's so many different species and so many different seamounts, they all may be differently affected. Um, we, what we do know across the board is that they are very sensitive to disturbances in their environments and are very slow growth. So if they are disturbed or they die, it can take a very long time for them to recover, for the reef to recover as they grow and usually to millimeters and centimeters per year, depending on the species. Some can take thousands of years to get back to where they were. That was an impressive organism that we just... A healthy looking sponge right there. Beautiful. We're seeing a lot more healthy sponges in this area. It's like a line of corals right there. It's interesting. I know I the, if that's like the high point ridge or something. There's a lot of researchers in the Azores Islands, which are part of Portugal, that are doing some interesting research on, like, lab studies on, uh, yeah, things like temperature, uh, sedimentation, different metal concentrations. Um, and they have a lot of habitat along the mid Atlantic uh, spreading center, so they're interested in one of those topics and there some of those areas are uh, near them are of interest for uh, uh, people that are interested in deep sea minerals so they're trying to be proactive and understand like if there was um, companies going after minerals there what would be some of the potential impacts on the biology from things like plumes associated with that activity I think Ocean X is in the Azores right now or are they? I think so, yeah. These rocks over here are interesting. Are these like pillow basalts? Mm -hmm. Anna? You're correct. Nice. I think I've asked you this before, but how, like, what determines, like, them looking like a pillow basalt? Is it just like, the how flow rate, the flow how rate. fast it's being, um, how fast it's moving and like being produced. So 
So is this fast or slow flow rate? Slow. Slow. Does that equate to soft, medium, or firm for your pillow? Oh. Don't strain yourself reaching. <laughs> don't. I don't. <laughs> It's funny you mention that because there actually was a uh, uh, group uh, N greater than one of uh, shipmates who made a sojourn in quest for a better pillow before we departed port. Yeah, it's hard to find a good a pillow that's just right for everybody. Yeah, it's <laughs> funny. Uh, I have my own here, and so does Dave. So, we, Tito, I think you did that. I think Robert did. I did. I got one for Robert and for yeah. myself. And success. Tag. I used to throw one on in my my uh, checked luggage, but I don't check luggage to come to Nautilus, so I just can't really throw my pillow in there anymore. So we've passed waypoint five on to waypoint six. Wow. <laughs> Made some progress today. Yeah. We're gonna get off watch in like 30 minutes and we're gonna get back on watch. They're probably gonna be just passing waypoint six. <laughs> <laughs> now we're gonna come back on watch. And throw throw like some shade there, Mike. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now we're gonna be doomed to the ascent. I think we're, oh yeah, because we're supposed to recover at 8, yeah. But from 1,400 meters, so. Yeah, it won't be that long. It'll be like hour and a half, maybe. We oh. did some dives in uh, Catalina Islands, uh, California, where we deployed the tow sled, but just to keep it cool. We put it down about three feet, uh, and you could actually see Herc for the majority of the dive. And we might have gone as deep as 70 meters, but maybe not much more. It is my goal to go visit Catalina Island before, like, I'm in, Ca in Los Angeles, because I've just heard it's oh, so right. beautiful. Yeah, it is pretty over there. But yeah, I think if it is, if we're picking her up at eight, then this will be like our first blue water talk. Yeah, right. we Go haven't yeah. gotten that before. It's going to get philosophical. Huh, what's going on with these branches? I swear these squat lobster wants to fight us. Yeah, he does. Bring it. Pose. Yeah. yeah. We'll free that up. These still have polyps right on them, don't they? Ooh. Maybe maybe too bright. Too bright. Uh, hold on. No, I can make that work. Sometimes I can't tell if we're in close if more yeah. light helps or... It doesn't really read like a zoanthid is spreading, but... No, those do, those do look dead. Uh, are we creeping in? Hold on, I'm just gonna snap out real quick, cause I'm... Uh, maybe not. I was pretty radically having to change focus there. Squat lobster's like, that's right, back away. This scared you off. I think my dog thinks that he scares the mailman away every day, not realizing that he. All right, mailman's mailman was never broken in, right? Any. It's true, he's left every time, so that's a success. My dog has the same thoughts. Yeah. You know, when our dog hears the FedEx truck, I think he's just mechanically inclined and he can hear the timings off a little bit. He wants to go out there and adjust it. Yeah, 
Yeah, we never miss a Amazon delivery at <laughs> my house. Got a warning system in the dog. I know uh, the closer we get to meal times, it's common for watches to talk about food, but the deeper we get in the legs, the more uh, uh, I hear talk of pets. And <laughs> how great would it be to have, you know, a uh, boat dog? Yeah, oh I think it gosh, would. So much fun. That'd be awesome. Yeah. They had a they had a cat come on board one time in port that they had to find and remove. We had two dogs on the Amelia project. Really? Um, yeah, but they were on a dive support vessel that was near us. Huh. I went over there and said hi to them. Uh, I did a year long voyage on the Nor. Yeah. A couple breaks, but it had a Shih Tzu on board for the oh. whole voyage. Oh, that's cool. Halfway through, we were in Istanbul and picked up a kitten. Aww. Nice. <laughs> so I hate to ask a logistical question, but is there like a little patch of turf for the poor dog to uh, <laughs> relieve itself? Be potty trained on, or how did that work? No, nope, it was a cleanup effort. <laughs> <laughs> Went where it wanted to. Constantly. Yeah. I don't. I don't think I want a dog on the on board. <laughs> I got a really nice picture of my cat, cat like bent over backwards into looking at the live cone. stream. So she's been watching us. You had grease pencils and a cone over Fine. the radar with your, put your hands in. Every once in a while it would get in there and the chief mate would go stick his face in it and scratch his nose. <laughs> okay. If there's a potty trained dog, we can bring it aboard. <laughs> Maybe I showed you this already, Mike. <laughs> yeah, that's cute. Aww. So we started in the middle of, in between waypoint two and waypoint three. Yeah. That's, <laughs> we've covered some ground. Mm -hmm. We said there's 10 waypoints. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, yeah I kind of like this slow and steady, just tracking a line along the feature. Yeah, I think that works really well. Instead of just doing move by move. Looks like we have a bit of a, like a, yeah. I can't think of the word, but like a, a rise, like a hill that we're gonna be at for waypoint six. I don't know if we'll get there though, on our watch. Probably not. I don't know, but I'm <laughs> sure Val will be looking for the manganese nodules in the saddle between waypoint six and waypoint. Seven. Oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah. It goes downhill. This a looks bit. like nodules. Yeah, that's a discoloration, oh. too. Check this out. Mm, I don't think so. I don't think so. Just like dark rock, pebbles. Nodules are a bit more sizable, usually. <laughs> yeah, I just think these are broken rock fragments. I think you're muted. No, you're not. Okay. I wasn't? I don't know. <laughs> You're just quiet. <laughs> this strange terrain. Mm -hmm. I know. Why do we find the nodules inside the saddle or in those like low areas? Well, I believe because they're low energy areas. 
because I was reading up on manganese nodules and it was saying how they need a very calm environment to grow. So maybe in the saddles because there's two elevated like peaks, maybe it's calmer in the middle. I don't know. I haven't. I I don't really understand the the saddle quite yet. <laughs> For viewers who are not sure what we mean by nodule, can you explain like yeah. what they are? What's the difference between that and like these size of rocks we're looking at now? Yeah. So the nodules that we're looking, well, the size comparison is kind of like a baseball or smaller. And it's just round and very, very circular and not fragmented, like I think these grains that we're looking at are. And also these grains seem smaller than a baseball. So. And why are we interested in our tools? What are we gonna learn from them? So we're gonna learn their growth rate pattern and what type of minerals are found in each of the patterns, because I, read that some patterns have different minerals than other parts of it. So you can tell by the different coloration in the manganese nodules. And actually, they just started picking up more recently in being mined. But the first time it was introduced to like the idea of mining these ma manganese nodules was the 1980s but they deemed it wasn't, it was like too much money and like too much yeah, to, get, to yeah. do anything during those times, like during the They're too 80s expensive and to 90s. get. Yes, so, but I think it started picking back up, if I remember correctly, I think it said 2017 or 2018, mining for the manganese nodules in the Pacific. Yeah, the cost is yeah. Also the now. demand for mm -hmm. metals like cobalt and stuff as well. Yeah. yeah. So, cobalt, copper, iron. Manganese. Manganese. <laughs> and we use those metals to create things like, like batteries in our yeah. like phones and computers and stuff. And then notably green technologies. Mm. Yeah. That's an oxymoron, huh? Green technologies needing to mine. Well, that's well, yeah, really the ecosystems. dilemma. Oh, you know, most green technologies require some sort of battery infrastructure. So yeah. um, that that's kind of one of the downsides is that uh, these, you know, EVs, electric vehicles and green technologies do require batteries that require mining and mining requires fossil fuels to acquire the metals. So it, it is a little, uh, that's a word. Hippo, hip Paradoxical? It? Paradoxical. Oh, oh, that's, yeah, a, yeah. that's a good word. Yeah, that's a good term. Yeah. I was thinking of Sorry, hypocrisy. can we turn to the left? There was a little red sea star. A little red sea star. Sounds like a children's book. I know. A little red sea star. Time. To the left, still. To the left, or to the left. Right there. Oh. Oh, different. Oh, yeah. Okay. Can we get a zoom, please? Just interested in imaging this for zoom? Um, it's a possible target, but let me see. Ooh. Yeah, it's not what we're looking for, but thank you. Right. You're free to go. Mm -hmm. These are not the stars you're looking for. Priority. Priority low. Priority samples. Very pretty, though.
Yeah, so it was, it was 2018 uh, that manganese nodules interest in, in mining manganese nodules. anyone's actively doing that though so. I don't yeah I don't think they're doing it yet they're testing for it in the yeah, Clarion Clipperton zone in where <clears throat> the Clarion Clipperton zone it's an area to the south southeast of Hawaii it's okay. a very large area there's uh, some images floating around of a ship that did some mining back in the spring and we have a back deck full of nodules and huh like a mountain of them like the mining machines are about, like if you were put on, not on the Nautilus's deck, go from edge to edge. They're very wide and very tall. So are there any kind of like environmental impact assessments going on? Is mm -hmm. that a requirement? Yep. That, of yeah. that is a requirement. That's something one of my labs is doing. We're assessing the pelagic um, communities above the Clareton Clippers in zone because mining impacts from nodule mining will create plumes into the water column. And it's important to assess what is there, how it is impacted by the mines, and what materials are being in those plumes. Mm. And because it's manganese, it's often pretty likely that there are toxic metals being thrown up into the water. And that's, no matter, matter what way you put it, it's gonna be really bad for any pelagic communities above them. Right, right. Are you quantifying those organisms in the water column by looking at the, uh, the video transects that were done? Um, no, these guys are higher up than what oh, ROVs okay. are typically looking at. Um, typically, we use midwater trawls to do a baseline study. So we do a couple different depths with a multi-netter netter, and just sort through the animals and make a kind of basic baseline of an area over a small area so we're not impacting a wider area. And then I, I imagine it's difficult to assess if it's plumes, and these plumes are not going to be bounded by any kind of boundary, but are going to be moving um, throughout the ocean. Yes. Um, we would expect them to settle at some point, given that it's going to be mostly metallic, but we are still assessing how long they remain in the water column and how big the influence is. Mm. So these could have, I mean, huge environmental impacts on... Look at that sponge. Yes, very big ones. That's a big, speaking of very big, very big sponge. Like Monolithic. There's several of them in a line. If you yeah. look at Hercules beat uh, the Atalanta oh, Yeah. Like Easter Island of sponges. <laughs> <laughs> Is that anemones on it? That looks like it might be... Oh, that's a Walteria sponge in it. Sponception. Where is the base of that sponge? Is it like Over toward the top? Huh? Or, um, where is the, you said there's another sponge with Yeah, this one that has the longer pieces yeah. coming yeah. off. Yeah, that, the base is somewhere inside that sponge, it looks like. I think it might, this big sponge might have just grown around this Walteria yeah. sponge. Yeah, I think the base of it is still on the rock. The There's smaller one. Several of these. Pull wide, little push. Oh, there's more. These are possibly the living versions of those dead sponges we saw earlier. Mm. Morphology looks kind of different though. Yeah. Sebastian, what you were just talking about earlier with those plumes and trying to find out um, how it's going to impact the life in that area. Um, could eDNA be something that's used to figure out anything about the species around? Um, yes and no. Um, yes, and that it would work. 
the problem is that for a lot of these deep sea animals, we don't have samples of their DNA. So we will just get a bunch of DNA where we will have like, oh, there's clearly a lot of biodiversity here, but we cannot assign it to any individuals. Yeah, a lot of the work in eDNA right now is building that library of knowledge of correlating what we're sampling with known biology. Mm -hmm. Most of it's unknown, I think it's fair to say, yeah. at this point. Which is why like, my lab is doing some of these trawls in a small area and doing a full baseline of what lives there, because if we can get a lot of the DNA samples for it, we can just use eDNA elsewhere. So with the mining, it's such a new kind of um, exploitation of our ecosystems. I, and I, I wonder, you know, because I've seen this happen on terrestrial areas where um, archaeological surveys, environmental impact assessments need to be done prior to development. And oftentimes, the data that's collected is not thorough. Yes. And so, because we know, you know, not much about the deep sea, I wonder how robust, you know, that kind of environmental impact assessments can really be when we don't have as much data. Um, that is a very good question because it depends on who you hire to do those environmental impact statements. Um, if you're going through just the mining companies with their own independent contractors, that could be more difficult to assess whether or not their, th their studies are quality um, and other factors. Um, certain, if you go through a university with a deep sea lab like that, it's usually a lot more ironclad with university contracts that um, are doing science a certain way. Um, so. Also, one second, can we stop and take a look at that yellow sponge? Sure. Do you want to stop the ship as well? Um, not quite yet. Um, Robo's on shift change. He could just stop the ship. No. Yeah, may as well stop the ship. Stop the ship. Yeah, it's not a sample target, but it's a very unusual sponge. So I want to get some shots. Bridge now. Yeah, I think the challenge with the the energy problem is we have, you know, fossil fuel burning transportation now. And to convert to something like electric cars requires batteries. But Go furthermore, a lot of electricity in different places is coming from fossil fuels. Uh, like where I live in the Pacific Northwest, 98% of my power comes from hydroelectric, which is a renewable resource. But if you're using electric car, but getting your electricity from a coal-powered power plant. Yeah. That negates some of the benefits. Well, that's why it's good to see solar taking off and yeah. wind. Uh, we can put yeah, solar panels still need mined uh, heavy yep. metals and rare yeah. earth elements, though, to, to manufacture. And normally are accompanied by batteries. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, uh, not if they're grid-tied, though. They don't store in batteries. It's a challenge. My house has solar panels, and it's basically like net metering with the electrical grid. So if we're overproducing from our panels, we're providing energy back to the grid. Right. And if we're underproducing, then we're, we're getting some of our energy from solar panels and some from the grid. So it doesn't fill into a battery at all? No. So if the grid goes down, then we lose power <laughs> like everyone else. But uh, So you're on the grid at night, and... On solar We're on the grid day. all the time. It's just how much we pull or give back to the grid is dependent on the, s the sun energy that we're getting. That's how most installations are. There's not a lot of people that are totally off grid. Um, most residential installations these days are yeah. still grid tied. It's very interesting that deep sea mining has to occur at this moment because it doesn't have to occur. That's well, a consideration. It's a consideration, <laughs> but like in terms of political like barriers, there's actually enough terrestrial deposits to fill the need that deep sea mining is aiming to fill. 
Um, the problem is that a lot of the mines that have these materials are in areas of either conflicts or have mining huh. that is of unethical circumstances. Um, so there's a lot of pressures there to move deep sea mining to a deep sea, to move into deep sea mining as an alternative, which is we're going to be very careful moving forward with and make sure that we are properly assessing the marine environments before we start mining, before we rush into anything that could have a wider impact. Yeah, I think there's a larger discussion to be had, though, about the extent we can, A, recycle materials for use, and B, alternative materials that are more abundant. Like, there's a lot of advances going on now in research in battery development. Mm -hmm. so there's we, alternative ways of storing energy. Yeah, what is, uh, what are the new, their lithium, L, what's the IP, uh, LPIN batteries? You know, uh, yeah, some material advances can negate some of the need, but think about uh, where you live and every, you know, gasoline burning engine within 10 miles of your house. That's that's hard to uh, do away with, but also impossible to sustain. Yeah, it's a grand challenge for sure. But I think um, you know we need we need to not be trading one one impact somewhere for an impact elsewhere if we can avoid it. Like it's something to put our research in. And uh, to political will to just figuring out. Wrap, yeah, wrap that thought up. In 1903, the Wright brothers flew the Kitty Hawk for the very first time. In 1969, man walked on the moon. So we can make a big advance in a short period of time. Uh, yeah, we've seen the serious impacts of, you know, terrestrial mining. And, you know, there's that fear that what's not seen in the ocean will be less of a source of conflict, right? For people, they won't know what's going on. And so I think we just need to be aware. Um, and I'm also curious as to who, how is the procedures for allowing or giving mining um, yeah, there's licenses? A deep Sea Mining, uh, International Deep Sea Mining Authority. And there's a ISA. wonderful the article in, was that Atlantic or Wired? That really explores that topic. International Seabed Authority. Thank you, that's it. Yep. Okay, I'm gonna go do my homework. It's a rabbit hole, be warned. It is a rabbit hole. If yeah, you want okay. some more guidance, you definitely can come talk to me if you want, Malia. Okay, sounds good. Because, you know, this is going to affect Hawaii and our fisheries and our ability to take care of our oceans. So it's a huge issue for yeah, our community. If, uh, there's an interesting, there's a broadcast called The Daily. That oh, yeah. Issues and they have yeah. A good, oh, they had a great article on it. On this. Watch, change of video. Thanks, guys. Full wide. Yes, we will finish this conversation later. Sebastian, I'll definitely take you up on some resources. Yeah, of course. Awesome. But all right, y'all, the Ford 8 watch is about to head out. We're about to go eat some breakfast. Yeah, goodbye. Thank you. You guys yeah, have a good rest of your day. Thank you to all our viewers for sending your comments and thoughts and feedbacks along the way. See you in eight hours. <laughs> Bye, everyone. So, aloha. Ahoy ho, friends.
Yeah. Up or? Aloha, Kakayaka. Buenos dias, Internet. I know you were worried about us, but the 8 to 12 watch is back. <laughs> yes, we are. Survivors. <laughs> Mostly sleepers. <laughs> Mostly sleepers. I hope everybody on watch did get some rest. It's awesome to be back with you this beautiful morning. I wish we could uh, quickly take you up to the surface to see amazing sunrise. Incredible cloud formations, mixing of swells, calm winds. This is Daniel Kinzer, Science Communication Fellow. We're just settling in on watch. And uh, excited to keep exploring with you all. Thanks for being here. All right, we're about 1,752 meters down, so we've made quite a bit of progress since uh, we got off watch last night. Yeah, we have. We're, well, we're still at 2,300, something like that, 2,400 meters. Uh, yep. It's amazing what eight hours can do. <laughs> uh, looks like there's some changes, too, so... Not quite as many bamboos, some more uh, quite large sponges. Still a lot of rocks. Still a lot of rocks on unnamed seamount number 11? Number 11. Number 11 here in Papahanaumokuakeo Marine National Monument, Sacred Waters, Wauwakua, Aina Kupuna. I'm sure. That's a pretty wild looking sponge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right in front of us. It's uh, got quite the spicule game going. Is that you, SpongeBob? <laughs> oh, yeah. That's great. And a crinoid on top of it. Yeah, same one that we're coming up over here, oh, too. Another one, yeah. So. Off we go. So, Kukui, it sounds like we got a bunch of rocks. Uh, not so much bio samples. No, not so much bio samples, but we did get some niskins. Okay. So. Right. I think that's good. We'll get you bio samples. <laughs> Even if it just takes collecting some water. Yeah, I think we were seeing something that was resembling uh, polyopagon on the way uh, during breakfast this morning, but this is definitely not it. I think this is Walteria. <laughs> yeah, that's what it looks like to yeah. me. Still logging, I guess. Uh, yep, that's what I'm seeing in uh, my animal guide, too. Great, with a crinoid on top. Yeah. Oh, yeah. a falling sea star. Oh, oh. 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 Yeah. hello there. 
Wow, that was very graceful. <laughs> Impressive. There are quite a few somewhat large sponges, it looks like, in the Atalanta view, right about coming up ahead of Hercules. Yeah, I was just told we passed through a bit of a sponge ground earlier. Beautiful. Not, not sure what type of sponges they were, though. It looks a little bit like uh, these guys yeah. here, except bigger. I know we saw one of those. I um, also was talking to some of the folks who were on watch, and far before we got on, there was yeah. a sponge ground of um, dead sponges with live sponges growing on top of it. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, so, so it could be it could be that same one, but I'm not sure. Okay, yeah, I just saw a couple of really big ones mm -hmm. uh, right before we came up. It looks like an Atalanta cam. There's one right off to the left. Oh yeah, yeah, there it is. And maybe one right off to the right. Yeah, the bamboo density has gone down quite a bit. Ah, it's up on the rock. Oh, wow. <clears throat> Can we get a zoom on this? Yeah, what is that? Could be any number. There's a couple different types of corals that will um, make that <coughs> um, sort of yeah. Because often we see Eurydicorgia doing that curly thing, but mm. this is definitely nope, not that. No, that looks like a black coral, which is that orange color to me. Kind of made it signified yeah. it. Um, <coughs> it's definitely oh, it's different. also convenient. Um, you can see the skeleton yeah. right here. <laughs> That's also um, pretty black, so that's also a good choice. But um, yeah. also the uh, the sort of singular-looking triangular polyps, which um, that you can see from here. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I've never seen a black coral that looks like this. Oh really? Yeah, it's they're not uncommon. It looks like there might have been another one there too that's brown yeah, now. Yeah, could be. Uh, or maybe there's stichopathies, stichopathies. Like that's what I. Was. Yeah, could be. I should probably start getting back out ahead of it. Oh yeah. Intel. I believe Daniel said stichopathies. Yeah. Okay, that's how you say it. Thanks. Where do you oh, say Oh, I, I, I don't know how to say it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's stick or stitch. Gotta love the English language for that. <laughs> <laughs> It, yeah. It's uh, the, follow the rules every time, except when you don't. Yeah. <laughs> Did you hear that over the? Thank you. <laughs> no worries. Look at that crinoid there, just enjoying the, that water column. It's up on top of that sponge. Mm -hmm. Is that a polyopagon sponge? I think it might be. Uh, it looks my, so some of the inside looks like it. says that looks like the polyopagons that I've seen before. Great. I, I'm couching those words very carefully. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you don't you. want to offend. The, you don't want to offend the sponge. I get it. Well, I'm I'm just not anywhere near an authority on that, and I'm not going to pretend to be. <laughs> I'm a rock person. <laughs> Fantastic. I don't know if it still exists, but there was a great policy at St. John's University uh, where they would make professors teach a course outside their 
their subject of expertise. And so you well, that's interesting. physics professors teaching poetry and you have you know, geologists teaching about sponges. And, uh, <laughs> that was a really interesting approach that fostered a lot of learning, I think. Yeah, well, speaking from experience, one of the best ways to learn is to teach. That's right. You have to know the material in order to oh, teach it. Right. Yeah. Otherwise, you're up there and you sound like you don't know what you're talking about because you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it also promotes just uh, teaching through, through questions. Yeah. Not all the answers, which is uh, sometimes useful as well. Yeah. Teaching through vulnerability. Mm. Totally, okay. yeah. I mean, I, I love it when I'm teaching in my field and somebody asks a question I don't know the answer to. Yeah. It's, it's such a cool learning opportunity. More than once I've had to stop a lab and go look something up so I could answer a question. Oh, great. Yeah. So what kind of rocks are we seeing here, Val? Um, good question. Uh, probably basalt, uh, covered in manganese crust. It, so we can't really get a, a positive ID on rock type just uh, uh, just from flying over them. We've got some sort of fish here. But um, mostly what we're oh, going to yeah. see on these seamounts are uh, basalts or tracky basalts, which are basalts that are more alkaline than basalts. <laughs> So a little bit more potassium, a little bit more uh, sodium than what is formally classified as a basalt. Oh, interesting. Sometimes they uh, differentiate a little bit. We uh, we can see things become uh, andesites or tracheandesites, depending on how alkaline we they are. In. Here, I would hazard a guess we're looking at somewhat more alkaline melts. Mm. And I think this is a halosaur. Halosaur. Yeah, look at that tail. That's Beautiful. how you can tell that it, well, there are many other ways, including like the face, the, the fins, um, but also when it's resting.